Then, uh, as Peter said, I'm going to give you a little bit a peek of what's happening when we do the development of the CSM model. And then uh, I see this the art of tuning and coupling. And you will see in the slide that it's really art. Then um, this is a little bit how we build the model all together. Then there is the first phase. You have every component, and here I have the land model, the sea ice, the ocean, the atmosphere, the land ice, every walking group, because it's each time a walking group, a section that built a part of the model, and every walking group built the the part that they're working on on their own and for csm2 it was an effort that started in 2010 and it lasted for five years that it's it's a big time investment and then after you have to put all the component together and uh, for CSM2, it's an effort that lasted three years. We wanted it to be shorter, but we met a lot of hurdles. Then this collaborative effort, we will have many meetings with everybody. It means that all the working group would meet in the same room twice a week. We had over 300 configuration that we tested, and we had thousands of simulated years and diagnostic then in a lot of run you did today you did only five days or one month run we did like thousands and thousands of years and csm2 was released the first version was released in a june uh, 2018 and right now we are working for the next version and uh, during this step of development it required two things that's tuning and coupling and it's two aspects that only the modeler are really aware of, and it's a little bit mysterious for other people, and it's why in this talk we try to demystify a little bit what we are doing. Okay, then first I will start to talk about the art of tuning a model. And what is tuning? Then you are going to adjust parameters that we call tuning knobs, to achieve the best agreement with observation. When I say tuning knobs, it's, sorry. Yeah, when I say adjusting parameter tuning knobs, you don't choose whatever. For example, gravity, it's a well-known parameter. You are not going to tune gravity. But you have parameters that are not as, as defined, and I'm going to, it's parameter that are weakly constrained by observation. Sometimes it's even parameter that only exist in the models that don't really exist in reality. And I'm going to give you an example here, a parameter that we use, it's called DCS, and it's the threshold diameter to convert between cloud ice to particle to snow. And I'm going to go a little bit explain what it is. Then you have serious clouds. It's clouds that are very high in the atmosphere, and they are mainly made up of uh, ice crystal. It's at altitude higher than five kilometers. And when you have big ice crystal, they are going to fall out of the cloud. And it's what we say, you convert the cloud ice particle to snow. And basically, the this, yes, this threshold diameter, it's a diameter that you are going to say when the ice particles are bigger than some diameter, you will remove them from the clouds. Of course, again, these diameters, it's going to be of the order of a few hundred of micron. You will not say that the ice particle can be one meter or something like this. Then it's something that it's still, constra it's weakly constrained by observation, but it's not like ridiculous. It's something that will be representative of what we know of what's happening in the cloud. Then what's going to happen when we do this? Then I have, I'm showing here two cloud on the, um, on the left here, it's a cloud that has a smaller DCS. Then it means that 
I remove more ice particles from this cloud. And on this side, I have a cloud that have a larger DCS, that it means that I allows the cloud ice particle to stain to the cloud. And what's going to be the impact on the climate of my model? Then basically, if you have less cloud ice, you will have the infrared radiation that will that will be, in this case, you will have more infrared radiation that will be able to go through the cloud and will be able to go back out of the atmosphere. Why on this side, you will have, you have more cloud ice and it will stop the infrared radiation. And this is an aside, but sometimes we're going, we will see this later, we will talk about cloud forcing. And you have two types of cloud, the um, low cloud and the high cloud in the model. And uh, the low cloud, they are going to have an impact, especially on the um, shortwave radiation, while the high cloud, the one that I'm talking about with DCS, it's basically in the long wave radiation. Then the low cloud impact will be of cooling the earth, while the high cloud it's warming the earth, even that the some little, yeah, over the Arctic, this can be a little bit different, but the big picture is this. This is just a picture of the type of cloud. Then uh, the second part of the thing that we are trying to do, then we look what's a parameter and an example is DCS. And the second thing is to achieve best agreement with observations. And this is here what I'm, I'm showing you the Earth's uh, energy budget of the atmosphere. You see the, the radiation coming from the sun and the infrared radiation emitted by the Earth and also emitted by the clouds. And um, this is basically at this level that I'm going to adjust DCS and it's going to change this outgoing infrared radiation in my models. And when we are going to adjust this DCS, for example, something we try to achieve, we know that at the top of the atmosphere, the radiative balance should be near zero. Then it's not exactly zero. We, we are right now in pre-industrial, it would be close to zero. Right now we are a little bit over zero, maybe 0.6 watt per meter square, but we know it's not like five watts, otherwise the planet would cool very quickly. Then why is it important to tune the radiative balance at the top of the atmosphere? And here I'm showing a, an example of a plot. Then in this plot, then the radiative balance is about one and a half watt. Here, the blue line is zero. And in this run, I get a radiative balance that's about um, one, yeah, one, one ish watt. And you see that the ocean, the ocean is warming. Then basically, if you have configuration of the model where you allowed to have heat coming in the system, the atmosphere has a heat capacity very small, then all the heats will end up in the ocean. And this is one of the parameters that we are tuning in, in the diagnostic that we'll, you will see this afternoon, we call this RESTOM, this parameter. But we are also targeting as a quantity when we tune, we look at the cloud forcing. It was the, the, the slide that I was showing earlier where you have the short wave cloud forcing and the long wave cloud forcing. We look at precipitation, we look at the ENSO amplitude, we look at the meridional oceanic circulation, the sea ice thickness, then there are a lot of things that we keep an eye when we are adjusting this parameter to produce a realistic simulation. And then when you are tuning, it's, it's, when, it's when it comes really dilemma, then first there are the subjectivity of tuning target. Then you cannot have everything good. Then you will have always to make Compromise. And for example, you can have the short wave cloud forcing that will look good, but then it will be to the detriment of the long wave cloud forcing or the 
the opposite. Then you have to make a choice. But the good news in this, it's overall the tuning has a limited effect on model skill. Even if you are changing the, the model skill state the same, if you are adjusting the parameters. Another thing it's, you want to tune for pre-industrial where well, you know that you are at radiative equilibrium and it's what we do for CSM, but you have other center that choose to tune to present day because it's where they have available observation while in the 1850, you don't have much observation. In CSM, we use, we tune to 1850, but we use present day observation because it's what we have for most of the variable. They didn't have satellite in 1850. Also then there is the question, if you want to tune the individual component then the land, the atmosphere, the ocean, or if you want to tune the couple model. The benefit of tuning in individual component, it's very fast. You can, especially for the land, you can do many, many run very quickly. While we do a couple model run, it's, it's much slower. But then there is no guarantee when you tune the individual component that it's going to transfer to the couple model. And I have a few examples later in the talk. And then the last thing, tuning, it's not only an exercise to have a good model, it's very educative because along the way you are learning a lot about the model itself during this tuning phase. And it's a phase also that's very educative, very instructive. And basically it's what I want to say about the tuning. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the coupling. And this is when we are going to put all the pieces to the, the model together. And I have this plot here. I say coupling, it's basically unleashing the beast. And the reason is that when you have, I'm going to put, if you are not familiar with the an acronym SST and AP, then in, if I do an emipron, an emipron, it's a run where I use prescribed sea surface temperature. And when you do this, the model, if you prescribe the sea surface temperature, the model cannot really drift much. But once you are using a fully coupled ocean, then it's what I say, you are unleashing the bees and the model can really drift one way or the other. For example, if this quantity that we were talking about, the radiative balance, what we call restum in a CSM, is out of balance. And I'm going to give you an example, and it was in CSM1 development and the previous version of the model, but I like this, this example because it was very dramatic. We did all the tuning in port with sea surface temperature prescribed, and it looks perfect simulation. We were so proud, it looks so good. And then after we put the ocean and the other component, and what we saw, we had immediately, if you see here, the SST, uh, you have a large SST arrow happening in the North uh, Pacific. And it goes very quickly. This is year one, year two. Then you see that in a few years, your model is dropping in temperature in uh, the North Pacific. And what's happening, basically, you, you started to have a little bit colder SST. It created more cloud in the North Pacific. Because you had more cloud, it created cooler SST. And you are going to have this feedback thing. And then because you have cooler SST, the sea ice is going to grow, and then it's going to get even cooler SST, and the model was a runaway model. Then we spent a lot of time fixing this. Then we had to make the compromise that the cloud forcing, the shortwave cloud forcing in the North Pacific didn't look as close as observation as we wanted. We had to cheat a little bit, increasing the cloud forcing, not to cool down the temperature in this area. And this is what I call again, unleashing the beast. Another example that I have here, it was again in CSM1, but it was a problem that was also very hard to solve and we didn't solve it indeed. It's when we try to put a new decor. We were using the finite 
volume die core and we went to the spectral element die core. Then on the, the final volume, it was a lat long grid while this was a cube sphere grid. And I think Peter Lauritsen talked about this kind of grid on Monday. Then we did this. And once again, we didn't learn our lesson. We did everything in CAM with prescribed SST. And both model finite volume of spectral element had very similar simulation. It was even boring. It was, you will change the die core and it looked basically the same. But then once we put the ocean under the atmosphere, what happened, you see that the first one, it's the finite volume die core. And in the spectral element, the SST dropped very quickly and destabilized about half a Kelvin colder with the SE die core. And it was basically a showstopper and we were not able to release the model with the version of the die core we wanted because otherwise we were going to miss uh, the um, CMIP5 run. And we determined that all of this issue was done is, is this very small shift between the two die core between the zonal surface stress. And it was this change in the upwelling zone and it was associated with the ocean circulation, it was what was responsible of, of this SST cooling. Then once again, it was a problem Then we knew what was happening, but we didn't know how to fix it. And it's not something I don't have a tuning knob that say, I'm going to tune and put back the, the surface stress a little bit south. I, I cannot change this. Then it was another example of unleashing the beast. The last example, it's the Labrador Sea issue that we had during the CSM2 development. And we have, are having similar issue right now in the development of CSM3. And basically here, this is a picture of the Labrador Sea, the sea ice, how it looks in CSM1, the sea ice X10. And if you look here at the black thin line, it's where you have the observed sea ice X10. And uh, the sea over here between Greenland and uh, Canada, it's called the Labrador Sea. And you see that during CSM2 development, this area of the Labrador Sea became covered with sea ice. And it was a big issue because once it get covered with sea ice, it will never recover. And we were able to determine where it was coming from. Why was it freezing? Then in CSM1, we had to see SST bias and a salinity bias. And it was a little bit too warm and a little bit too salty. In CSM2, we had the opposite bias. It was a little bit too cold and a little bit too fresh. And we have bias that go different direction. But then in this case, in CSM1, this warm bias and salty bias was helping us with the Labrador Sea, it would prevent that it freeze. While in CSM2, it was what was happening, the Labrador Sea was freezing. Because we had bias, not yeah, similar, maybe a little bit larger in CSM2, but similar amplitude, but just the other direction. And it's again, something that's happening when you are doing the coupling. Okay, then this is a short overview of of what we are doing when we are doing development. Then as a summary tuning, it's adjusting parameter, what we call tuning knob to achieve best agreement with observation. And here it's shown you an example of DCS, which is the threshold parameter to convert between cloud, ice, particle to snow. And we saw that tuning involves choice and compromise because it's impossible to get everything right. But during tuning, you can learn a lot about the model. And then what I call the art of coupling, it's when you put all the it's when you put all the different components together. And I gave three examples here. One in CSM1 when we had a coal bias in the North Pacific with CAM5. Then it was perfect when we had prescribed SST, but then we had this coal bias when we 
couple all the components together. In CSM12, we saw that when we try to change from the finite volume dichord to the SC dichord, the SST stabilized much colder. And in CSM2, we had a problem with the Labrador C that was ice covered. And it's very short, but it's to give you a glimpse of what we are doing when we do model development. Thanks, Cecile. That's great. Just getting some idea of how much work goes into like, building these instruments, these models, and to make them useful for the questions that we want to do research with. And like some of these real issues that take a huge amount of resources and a huge amount of time. And so Cecile has been one of the leading people keeping this effort going. So uh, we all turn to Cecile whenever anything goes wrong and say, how do we fix this? So she's amazing. So if there's any questions about like, about how we go through this process or what this really means, please step up to the mic and we've got some time for questions. Hi, thank you. I was uh, curious, like when you see these like coupling challenges and understand why it happened, do you go back to the like separate models or do you kind of modify it within the coupler or? Yeah, we do. It depends on the problem. Then for example, with the um, TIs that we have right now, we are trying to keeping the problem that I'm showing here, we didn't go to individual component because it's something that happened during coupling. Then right now we do a lot of all the fine tuning. Now we do it in couple mode because in the past we, had, we have been hit by this drift when we work with the individual component and then when we put together. Then it depends on the problem. Sometimes we go back to the, in, it depends on the problem. If now we have to include a new parameterization to try to fix a problem, then we will go in the standalone. But otherwise, we will do it in the tuning and the coupling alone. It can we try to do it only in uh, the couple mode. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say like uh, with Cam, you actually went back and took everything out from going from uh, Cam four to Cam five, right? To work out which components it was that were actually contributing to a lot of the issues that you were encountering. So once you got the model into a place you liked it, try to work out why. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. It was a great presentation. Um, actually, at at present, I'm trying to look at. Uh, I'm I'm kind of doing a comparative. Study. Can you remove your mask just to yeah, talk? Yeah. Okay. So and, is it fine now? Yeah. No. It's yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. So uh, currently I'm trying to do a comparative study where I'm trying to uh, assess the Antarctic sea ice thickness uh, and trying to select the best model uh, in the whole CIMIP-6. And CESM2 has performed consistently well for extent and concentration of sea ice in the Antarctic. So I'm here uh, facing a problem because um, CSM2 has very high errors for when sea ice thickness is concerned. So uh, I just want to know that what would you suggest would be the best methods for bias correction of the CIS thickness in, in the model? Yeah, then sometimes the way that we change, we tune some of the CI thickness, it's to change the, the diameter of the snow particle, the snow particle on CIS. You We change, the, sorry, the albi of some of the particles, but I'm not the expert. You, and the problem is that there is the polar working group this week, then all the experts are not here, but I think will, Dev Bailey will be, uh, Dev is talking tomorrow, then it would be more question for the, but you can adjust some parameter of the snow that's covered the sea ice to try to reduce the sea ice thickness, but. Yeah. Thank you. I think we do have a we have a um, a practical on sea ice um, at some stage too. Yeah. Also, there will be breakout session on a Friday yeah. to do this. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'm wondering if there's any systematic way of tuning parameters similar to how neural networks uh, uh, update their weights of parameters during the training process, or if the scientists tune different parameters manually. Yeah, then the, there is a, there are several effort going to try to to tune the parameter more automatically. Then and um, there is a, another model called E3SM that's developed at um, National Lab that was that was basically based on a 
the, it was based on CSM and then we, we separate and they are, tuning, they are trying to, do, to change the way that they do the tuning. There are some tuning effort with machine learning and, but right now we still do it manually. It just, it's hard to, there was a lot of people that are tuning the model and they've been there like for many, many years and, and it's hard to, because of this compromise, you can, there are stuff that you can adjust maybe automatically, but you, you need to, to have some compromise what's going to make the model better than maybe to have a matrix of something. We are trying to develop this, but right now a lot of it is still manual. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd just add for like the land model, uh, we actually do uh, uh, perturba uh, parameter perturbation experiments where we basically go and perturb all experiment, all the parameters individually over a whole, and they call what's called, um, they then go back through with machine learning and try and work out the combinations and do emulators to work out what the influence of different parameters over different ranges are. So that that is an effort that we have. It's not the way that the model is actually being tuned right now. It's more an exploratory, exploratory uh, investigation into the model itself and the sensitivity to all the parameters. But they do these things like Latin hypercubes where they try and expand the whole space to work out each individual parameter, how much influence it has. Uh, so that is something that we do within Component models, but when the, all the models brought together, there are so many working pieces. Yeah. It still comes down to being as there Cecilia is too said. much degree of freedom, and also with the land. The land is a pretty cheap component compared to the atmosphere of the ocean. Then it's it's a really nice effort, exploratory effort to look at all the parameter. But once you put all the component together, then it's become there are so many degree of freedom, and we don't have like hundreds of, we, we tune a few parameters depending on what we want to target, but there is not so many tuning parameter that we use when we reach the couple stage. When in the land, I don't know how many tuning parameter you have in the land. In, in CAM, we have, we have tuning parameter that we adjust during model development, but after they stay like this and we just focus on a few. Right. That, I think target. there was like 60 parameters they were actually going through. And mm -hmm. then a lot of them, they said they're not having very much influence at all. Mm -hmm. And so they broke it down to about maybe 12, 13 parameters that were really key to getting photosynthesis right, getting transpiration right, getting leaf area index right, getting all those components right. So as you say, like you can explore this massive space and then by sensitivity, you can narrow it down. But the same thing, we tried doing that for CLM5 and we had this effort. And in the end, Rosie Fisher, said okay we can't get this model to work this this way and so she just by her knowledge of the system tuned up the parameters within the clm space to get all the elements the emergent properties of the model that we'd like so clm5 wasn't done with the, with the perturbation experiments it was done purely through uh, expert knowledge tuning to get to that point and and that's sort of where we ended up and and it was interesting because this is an anecdote, but uh, her husband was the one that try, was trying to do it with machine learning, and she was the one that ended up fixing it by her own personal knowledge, and that kind of actually worked as opposed to the machine learning not working at all. <laughs> Did they divorce? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, Ben and Rosie still happily together. <laughs> um, I don't know what. So, yeah. Go. Hi. Uh, well, thank you for thank you for your presentation. I thought it was very Illustrate, illustrative. And uh, my my question is about um, coupling, but the coupler itself, I don't know if this is gonna be discussed later on in the tutorial, but I, mm, there was, for instance, some comments this morning in the Ocean Talk about how the distinct times in coupling in like the feedback of the information between the atmosphere and the ocean, uh, how is different? How that differs from different uh, different components that that does have an effect on on all these uh, tuning things? Or, yeah. I, and how is it done? I didn't see the ocean talk this morning. There are two type of coupling when in our jog. It was only then we yeah. talk about coupling when we say how often two components talk together. They talk about yeah. Then they, 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 they can that. talk, you can make the component talk together like once per hour, once per day, and they are coupling frequency between 
So he the, said it was different. Like I think it was one uh, one hour for for the ocean and thirty thirty minutes. Well, that's the time step. It's not a. No, I'm confused. But I think maybe one day and half a day for atmosphere and ocean. Yeah, to talk to together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So then I don't know how. I mean, how the model does to kind of. Um, make it work i mean are different methodologies to kind of give yeah people... then the model will have different time step then you will have like for example in the version of cam that you are using here the atmospheric model it's a 30 minute time step but then uh, i think the land has the same time step at the atmosphere but different component that can have different time step and then they they talk together, then they will do their own thing to look, for example, you are going to run for a day, look at the cloud, and then you send the information to the ocean and the ocean will see, yeah, what's the effect of the cloud that are going to cool the surface, the sea surface temperature then. And it's something that's going to matter. We have play with the coupling frequency to try to see how it change. It changed the simulation. It's not something, but you don't want to, if you do it very often, if you do it at every time step, then it becomes very expensive to have the different component talking okay. together very often. Thank you. But yeah, and we can also talk more. I don't know how much time, yeah, we are already, maybe I take this last question, but. I, I'm not here this afternoon because I really need to do some simulation, but I will be here tomorrow for the practical. And then on Friday, I will be the atmosphere practical and I'm planning also to stay over lunch than anybody that, has, that wants to work on the exercise of the atmosphere because there is a lot. I will stay over here and um, I can help and I can answer the question. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the presentation. So I have uh, two questions, but probably we have time only for one. So what I wanted to ask is uh, we do tuning using uh, oftentimes uh, observations of our current time. And I'm wondering if there is a risk that we will achieve a model which perform well in present time, uh, but with maybe its physics will not be uh, good for the future, right? Maybe to present well the present time because we just we use this target as a tuning, but when it comes to future, do, can we trust these models or not? Yeah, and this is this is a question we will know. In, it's it's a very difficult question because if you pick the version of the model that does the best observation for present day, some phenomena can change in the future, and then to use this model for projection can be tricky. But it's hard to we right now the. The strategy is to do the model that's going to represent the best the 20th century, and then to say, okay, now I'm going to run it further and see and trust it that it will continue to do well. But we don't only the the young people like you will know if we did it right or not. And I, I think um Gokan brought up this like the uh, the last glacial maxima was way too cold. So when we did it out of sample with CSM2. And so, John, who's going to be here for the isotopes talk tomorrow, um, or was it Friday? He uh, diagnosed that there were certain parameterizations in the model that meant that the cloud atmosphere interactions caused the model to have too much climate sensitivity to equilibrium. And I think Gokhan presented that, and that was a realization that out of sample, in the paleo example, where we had some proxy records to be able to support what we think the, the Earth looked like, the model did a very poor job of doing that. So it's not just the it's not just the historical period and it's not just the current satellite period. We really want to see this model work through all these different climate regimes. And uh, otherwise we, it doesn't allow us to have, um, I guess, a degree of authority or belief in the model in future projections. If we know that it doesn't work outside of the, you know, the, the current experienced climate. So it's yeah, really and, important. And to complete what Peter is saying, because we, we often during model development, you cannot test, you test, for historical, then from 1850 to present day. And then after we do all this simulation paleoclimate and Jiang find that there was some issue with the climate sensitivity. 
an EF adjust parameter. And now we are thinking that in the next version of the model, we are going to tune with this parameter, but for CSM2, this it's a little bit, yeah, for, in this case, it's an after the fact, we, it's going to improve the next version. We didn't do the simulation. We cannot do, otherwise we will never release a model if we try to do everything at the same time. Then we do the historical, and then when he did the paleoclimate, he, he spent a lot of time to try to play with different parameters that we use to improve the paleoclimate. And it, now we are trying to include his work into the model, the next version of the model. Right. And, and we you. also found similar problems with the land model at very low CO2 levels. Like we would have all the plants die and we realized, well, maybe our CO2 sensitivity is too high. So we being able to use the model outside of the current climate environmental conditions is really important. Do, do we have time for a second question or not? I think uh, so. I think, yeah, maybe I can. One quick question okay, then, one... Jesse. You're... If someone else wanted to ask a question or it's fine. It's yeah. fine. Oh. Yeah, so my second question is actually related to this. So, uh, you know, in the first day of presentation, we saw uh, an image with uh, scores of different models in the CMUP6 uh, against different targets, right? And CSM2 performed the best, I think, in the group. And, uh, you know, uh, it was shown that this is uh, a good motivation to attract people to do development for this model and stuff like that. So I was wondering, is there like, um, you know, uh, is there community transparent on their Turing practice? Because I can imagine how, depending on the group and what target they use, uh, you know, for present yeah. time tuning, you can arrive in a situation where some models will perform better in present times just because they chose the choice of tuning. So in CSM, I think it's an advantage that we don't tune maybe to the just present time, but maybe even to before, because it gives more objectivity. But I was I was wondering if everyone is uh, you know honest about it. Yeah, then we had it's not that honest, not honest. Then it's that sometimes we don't really. We don't really publish all the detail, the nitty gritty detail, but there, were, there, there is a paper that came recently, not recently, a few years back, but I can share with you the paper that we compare the tuning strategy in different modeling center. And in this paper, we really try to explain what we are doing for several several models compared the tuning strategy. And it's what I was very interested in it's why when I had this slide over here, when I say that different model, different center, sorry. Yeah, different center use different tuning strategy then. And it's, I found it was very interesting to me to talk with different, because in a CSM, we are very focused on the cloud forcing and it just, but as a, as a model, we'll have different strategy for tuning. But I think it's becoming more, I have, we, for CAM, just for CAM right now, I have put together, if you go on the CAM website, there is a document that tried to explain, we had started to explain how we do the tuning in CAM, that people can do it itself. And then one last thing that I want to add, CSM can look the best in some, metrics that we are looking for CSM2, but I'm sure that if you look at other metrics, it will not be the best model. It's just, it, it, you cannot be the best model in every, in the model that are bet in every matrix, but you cannot be the best model, I think, in every metric. And I think following up on that, it's like there's all these competing forcings going on. So you can get the right transient climate response for a period of time, but not have the right equilibrium climate sensitivity. So like your understanding of how CO2 operates within the, the climate system can be wrong, but if you have other competing uh, sort of offsetting forcings in that, such as aerosol forcings or land use forcings, then you can get the right transient response, but not have it for the right reasons. So the, it's, a, it's always the challenge. It's a challenge of understanding the climate system. There's all these unknowns still. That's the other side. You know, it's not like a perfect science. And we don't need space. We don't tune the climate sensitivity. It's something that come out of the model and we do a double CO2, but still it's, as we are trying to reproduce the 20th century, we are going to discard the version of the model that don't represent the 20th century well at all. Then it, even that we don't tune it effectively, there is still like, we still select some version of the model. Okay, thank you but very I much. But I will point you to this paper because I think it's, yeah. Thank you very it's much. a good paper, yeah.